This is the Influencer Entrepreneurs Podcast with Jenny Melrose, where I strategize with business owners on how to grow and scale their businesses to hit their income goals. This is episode 179 of the Influencer Entrepreneurs Podcast with Jenny Melrose. Today, I am diving into how to think like a boss with Kate Krakow. Kate is the author of Thinking Like a Boss, as well as the podcast Thinking Like a Boss. And it's actually interesting the circumstances for how Kate and I were introduced to each other via email. And it we come to actually find out that she, you'll hear it in the interview, but she grew up on the same street that the school that I taught in in New York was on. So it was actually quite interesting. We had some, we talked about some similar places. She mentions Stitzel Field actually in the interview, which is this big outdoor, of course, baseball field where all of the big games for baseball were played. Um, but it was definitely a really fun interview to be able to talk to someone that had similar experiences growing up. And also, as you'll see, definitely has similar theories as to what I have. Kate, as we talked about in the beginning, is an author. And as many of you know, I also have my book, Influencer Entrepreneurs, is out. If you haven't already grabbed your workbook, please make sure that you do. We put the, together the workbook so that you would have an opportunity to be able to go through the exercises. And you can find that at jennymelrose.com forward slash book. Um, and you'll want to grab those so that you can get those done. All right, guys, let's dive in. Welcome, Kate, to the podcast. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for having me, Jenny. Of course. I'm thrilled to have you on. We're going to dive a little bit into our story, but you and I kind of connected via email, and it started off that you were actually from the same area that I grew up in. <laughs> you know what's really crazy is one of the schools that you taught at, I live on the same street. Oh I don't think goodness. I mentioned that. Yeah. No. So you were down by Krieger then. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. That Isn't is so it? crazy. Such a small it's world. Very much a small world. Well, will you introduce yourself and your business to my audience? Yeah. So I'm Kate Kraco. I'm a psychotherapist, a confidence and mindset coach for female entrepreneurs. I'm an author. I just published a book in February called Thinking Like a Boss. I'm a mama to two little girls, 18 months and three years old. And we live in New York with my husband and our rescue dog, Turbo. And uh, yeah, I wish that we were able to connect when you were here. I know it It would have been amazing. So you talked a little bit, um, your book, I'm trying to do the timeline. So when you were writing the book and I know you baby, baby, like little baby, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it actually started, I started writing it right after my first daughter was born. So this is back in 2017. She was probably about five months or so. And I was just feeling like completely overwhelmed. I had my business and I felt like I lost it all. You know, I gained this beautiful little bundle of joy, but it felt so hard to try to balance both things like the business and having the baby home. And everyone said to me before having a baby, it's Kate, it's going to be really hard. Babies don't nap all the time. You can't rely on that. You're going to have to like really figure it out with your business. And I didn't want to believe them. And unfortunately, it was just really hard to try to find that balance and find that new normal, which we're talking a lot about now. Um, and, you know, again, I just felt like I am not making the income I used to make in my business. I'm an unable to work the 70 hours or so that I used to work a week. Now I'm lucky if I can find 10 and I had to really like refigure things out and start over in my business. And I just started to journal and I did it in my phone. So I'm actually, I'm sitting in the, the nursing chair right now where this book all began because nursing you know, you're nursing pretty much all day long. You're shaking your head. I know you probably get it. <laughs> yeah. And um, 
I just started to write on my phone. I downloaded Google Docs and just started writing all my feelings, all of the lies that I was telling myself, like the inadequacy, feeling the mom guilt, all that stuff, um, which ended up turning into chapter seven of the book. And um, it was a long process. So it's now, you know, 2020. So it was almost a good two and a half year process from the idea of the book to getting the book out there and published. Okay. No, very good. Now, while you, when you had your first daughter, five months old, and you started writing the book, were you also, cause you had a practice that was like in a physical space that wasn't like you were working from home. Were you also still had the physical space as well? So luckily before she was born, um, I just, you know, I'm really big into like listening to my intuition and, really just trying to figure out, you know, what's best. And something just kept telling me, close the physical space, close the physical space, just rely on your coaching business. And my coaching business was at a place where it was making enough income that I didn't really need the private practice anymore. Uh, So I decided it was, again, this was really funny too. When I first found out I was pregnant, I just had this gut feeling the second I found out I was pregnant that she was going to come early. And because of that, I luckily was able to plan. So I decided I closed the physical practice about a month before she came. And then the next week she was actually born. She came three weeks early. Oh my goodness. Yeah. No. Oh my, wow. And you talk a little bit about intuition in your book as well. And we're going to dive into, there's some stories in the book that you shared that just, oh, it gave me like chills as I was reading it. So let's start off with how do we as women business owners show up confidently? Because you talk a lot about confidence and actually think like a boss if we're often trying things in our business that we've never done before. Yeah. I think the best way to show up confidently is just to show up as yourself. And I say, just show up as yourself, which for so many people, it's hard because they feel like, oh, but I'm not there yet, or I'm not put together, or I'm not like everyone else. And I think that's the beauty with having your own business is you get to show up however you want to show up. And for me especially, and I know a lot of women feel this way, if I had waited till I felt qualified or I felt more physically put together, you know, was dressed up, had makeup on to do Instagram lives or stories or whatever, I would still be waiting five years later because you are never ready enough. Like there's never the right time. You never have enough time. So I think the best way to confidently show up is just to show up as yourself and your messy self and people will resonate with that. Again, they, I think it's Marie Forleo who says this, when you're trying to talk to everyone, you end up talking to no one. So show up, share your story, whatever that might be. Maybe it's like very different with other, than other people. And if so, that's great because there's going to be people who really resonate with that. Yes. And I think when you do that with your confidence, the more and more you do it, more confident we become. It's kind of like a muscle. You're using that new aspect of your confidence in whatever it is that you're doing, which of course can be scary because you are taking a risk in order to do something new. But when you start and actually take that leap, you the next time you go to do it, whether it's Instagram live or you're trying to speak in front of an audience, it's that much easier. Oh yeah. I always say the only way to grow your confidence is through consistency. It's doing that thing that's uncomfortable, that's hard, that feels really scary over and over and over again. And before you know it, it feels easier. I remember the first time when I launched my podcast, I I can't tell you how many times I re-recorded that intro. I just kept stumbling on my words. I was so scared, so afraid. And like the first few interviews was, they were so uncomfortable. But again, the more you do it, sometimes you end up finding out that you really love it. And I think that often that thing that we're most afraid of is really like that biggest gift and that thing that we can sort of master and become really good at if we try. Whether you're a seasoned podcaster or just thinking of starting a podcast, you need to listen to Buzzcast from the folks at Buzzsprout. Here we go! Buzzcast covers everything a podcaster should know. 
from marketing strategies and how to make money from your podcast to the latest and greatest tech and industry insights to keep you on the cutting edge. Follow Buzzcast by clicking the link in the description or go to buzzcast.buzzsprout.com and keep podcasting. Yes. No, I, for, for me, I feel like that uncomfortable feeling that I would get was always a sign to me that this is, this is growth. This yeah. is growth and the business is going to continue to grow. If I feel uncomfortable, I'm stretching myself. I'm pushing myself to do something a little bit different that could very well move the business forward. I love that. I always say with these lies that we tell ourselves, I think so many people think, oh, there's something wrong with me. Like, why does this keep coming up? Why does, why do I keep believing these things? And I say, if you want to live, if you don't want to feel them, live a very safe and comfortable life. Like don't grow, just stay where you're at, have that cushy job and that's it. But if you decide that you want to live a life of growth and expansion, these are always going to come up and it's actually a good sign when they come up. Yes. And I think for some of us, especially as entrepreneurs, it can be kind of hard for our families to understand, especially I think our age, we're a little, I'm a little bit older than you, but we grew up with parents that probably, you know, same kind of dynamic. Um, For me, leaving a teaching salary where you were guaranteed retirement and you had summers off, it was like the most insane thing they could ever think of because it was that consistency. But I did have that feeling like, yeah, sure, I could do this. But I'm miserable. Like this isn't what I was meant to do. There's no kind of push in the direction that I feel like I'm actually leaving a legacy or affecting lives the way that I wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so sales definitely has a negative connotation, but in your book, you compare compared your products or services to a warm batch of brownies. And I'm telling you, when I read this, I just sat there and I was like, I need to read that again because it was so good. Can you tell a little bit about what that means and what that kind of looks like? Yeah. So brownies are one of my favorite desserts. So I decided I'm going to say sales equals brownies for you. If it's chocolate chip cookies, whatever that dessert might be a warm cake, but think of it as, and it's funny because as I'm writing this book, I'm envisioning Stitzel Field. I don't know if you remember Stitzel Field in Poughkeepsie. Yeah. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So I, I think of a nice fall afternoon going to like our high school homecoming game, or you're going to some type of sporting event or wherever it might be. And you decide to bring, you decide to break bake brownies or cookies, whatever it might be. And you bring them with you, you open that tin up and let's just say you're by yourself and you're sitting, you are watching that game and you start to eat them would you just sit there and eat them alone? Or would it feel more natural to say to the person sitting next to you or below you or above you, hey, would you like a brownie? Would you like a cookie? Would you like to try one of these? And that's probably what you would do. I don't think anyone would just sit there and eat them and not offer to share them. <laughs> and the, the person next to you might say, yes, I love brownies. Thank you so much. Those smell delicious. I would love to have one. The person below you may say, I love brownies, but I'm on a diet or I'm allergic to gluten, so I can't have one. The other person may say, um, I just actually don't like them. So no, thank you. And that's exactly what sales is like, right? You're going to Put that invitation out there because it's something that you love, something that means a lot to you, that feels like an extension of you. And some people are going to say yes. And then other people are going to say no for whatever reason. Maybe it's not the right time or you're just not the right person for them to help them. And then some people are just not going to need your service and that's okay. But my point here is, If you were to just sit there, I guarantee that those people probably wouldn't turn to you and just say to a stranger, hi, can I have your brownies? Can you share one with me? You have to put that invitation out there. And without that invitation, they're not going to be able to accept your offer. So think of sales in the same way, right? If you're not showing up, if you're not saying, hey, I am available, I am open for service 
or whatever your products are, they're not going to just reach out to you and say like, Hey, I need to have what you have because they're not going to know about it. And they're not going to maybe feel comfortable. Even if you, if they do know about it, you have to put that invitation out there. And if we can just think of sales as an invitation, it makes it so much easier. Yes. And I love that you talked about the fact that someone's going to be gluten-free and someone's not going to like chocolate. Um, Cause it is, I think that piece of sales that a lot of us hesitate on is we don't want that. Someone saying, no, we don't yeah. want to get that negative feedback that no, this isn't great for me. But if you go into it, knowing that you're meant to attract who you're meant to attract and you're going to find those right people and all you can do is offer and see what happens. It just makes it that much easier and that much more of a conversation. I think that's the great thing is, oh, you're gluten-free. How long have you been gluten-free for? Or yeah. oh, you don't look for this service because you've already been working on this. Like those are the conversations that have to start. So you talk about nine lies that we as business owners tell ourselves that hold us back from thinking like a boss. What do you find is the biggest lie out of all of them that your clients tell themselves? It's probably the time one that there's not enough time. You know, if I had more time, I would be doing X, Y, and Z. And I think it really comes down to priorities. Like, is this a priority for you? If it's a priority, you will find the time to make it happen. Like I think of your book, right? Like you published this during a pandemic and you could have said, you know what? Timing isn't right right now because kids are home things are busier. I'm just going to put it off. But it was a priority. It was something that you really worked towards and you knew, no, I'm going to get it out there right now. No matter what's going on in the background, how crazy it might be, this is something I'm going to make happen. And I really believe when we make something a priority, we will make it happen. Yes. And I think even finding that finding that time, you know, we often have that kind of thought pattern of, um, this is when I'm going to have my time to be able to work, but you can always find those pockets. And especially with those that have young children or older children now home because of all this craziness with COVID that you can find those times and have that conversation with your significant other so that you can find them and make it work for what you're looking for. We were actually talking about that before we even started the interview about how you figured out a schedule so that you have your time to work on your business and the girls have their time to be taken care of and do their thing. Yeah. And I think it's never going to feel comfortable and you have to really work through that. So it might be waking up at 4 a.m. to get stuff done before the kids wake up. Or it might be working on the weekends. And there may be arguments with your spouse. Like it's not always easy to get on the same page. But I think that's what it comes down to is like, how badly do you want this? And I feel like that's the message that I've always received, especially the last few years. It's like, how badly do you want this business? How badly do you want this book to work? If it's that bad, you will do whatever you have to do to find that time. And I think a big part of the time piece is setting boundaries, setting boundaries with yourself, boundaries with clients, with family, with friends, because you can't do everything. Like we're not super women. Yes. We can't do it all. You actually just started to touch on my next question. If there are, are there any exercises that we can do to kind of get past this? Yeah. So the first thing I always say is what are the first three things that you can just cut off of your calendar, like cut out of your, cut out of your life? Like what are three things that you're doing all the time that aren't serving you? So maybe it's like staying up at night, just scrolling on your phone. And I'm guilty of that at times. Um, maybe it's like, watching Netflix. I mean, I think it's good to have a little bit of an outlet. Like you definitely need to have a place where you can let your stress out, but there are seasons of rest and seasons of hustle. This is just what, what I think. Um, and there are going to be some seasons where there might not be space to watch TV or to get to socialize a lot. And you've just got to put your head down and get the work done. And right now I sort of feel that way in some, in some senses, like, yes, it feels like it's a little bit of a lean back season, like having kids home and getting to spend time with them. But when I'm not just enjoying that time with them, 
I'm working hard in the business and I'm not really socializing and, you know, just like watching TV. So I think what are three things that you're doing right now that just aren't serving you? Um, and how can you cut those out? And what are things that you can start saying no to? I think, you know, making a list because there's so many things that we can constantly be doing in business, but are they really necessary? Like, are, is this really an income producing activity? Is this really going to lead to sales? Or am I just doing this maybe because I feel like I need to, I should, or I have to. And I talk about that all the time. Um, so something that I reevaluated um, back in the fall was writing my blog posts. I realized there's not a lot of people going over to my blog and reading these blog posts. And I'm spending like an hour a week sitting down and writing them. I think that I can better spend my time in a different area. So let me just cut those out. And I think, again, like we just do things because we're used to it. It's out, of, it's out of habit, but is it really leading to a sale for you? Is it really leading to growth for you? And if it's not, just stop doing it. Yes. No, I definitely feel like I've had that conversation with so many clients, especially during this time of, and it normally is social media. They're trying yeah. to be everywhere. They're trying to start a TikTok and they're doing yes. YouTube and they're doing Pinterest and Instagram and Facebook. And I'm like, Oh boy. And it is, you need to decide not only is it, like you said, definitely income producing, but is your audience even there? That's I true. Yeah. Had one particular client that I was speaking with and her audience is 50 and older and talking about fashion. And she's like, well, I need to get TikTok going. And I looked at her and I was like, why your people aren't there. You're going to have like 20 year olds watching you do whatever it is that you're doing. And it's not serving the audience that you're looking for. So if you want to do TikTok style videos and you think that that'll work well for your audience, put it somewhere where they're actually going to find it, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, wherever that audience is. So really looking at it, it's such a good way to kind of look at those tasks and figure out what is the right thing to put my time and energy into right now? And then the other piece that I feel like we're running into, especially right now, is that because we are home, we are thinking, we're putting the expectation on ourselves that I'm home, there's nowhere to go, I should be getting so much done. Yeah. But yeah. there's actually that kind of, there's a feeling that goes along with that, not only of the expectations that they're putting on themselves, but also the whole, we're in a pandemic and it doesn't feel comfortable. I mean, I was telling you how we drove up towards Pennsylvania recently and I got there and there were, everyone was wearing a mask. It was very different. There's that anxiety that I feel like that comes along with this. Totally. Um, so kind of like, putting that into perspective and understanding I'm not always going to be where I want to be in my business and kind of being able to move forward with it. Yeah. I think that, you know, for so many people, they say like, I just want to go back to how things were and we're never going to go back to the way things were, which is actually a great thing because we shouldn't go back to the way that they were. I think that people were being overworked. I think that we were so distracted and in many ways, this has slowed us down, made us be more intentional. Um, and for me, like there's been so much, you know, loss and devastation everywhere, but there also is a lot of good that's come from it. Like I've been able to spend time with my kids and this is time that I'll never get back. Yes. Um, so I think we have to just remember also, like, this is just a tiny little, like not even a chapter of our life. This is like a sentence of our life right now. And taking this time, like if you don't grow your business at all, if you just, if your business just survives, like you're in a great place. Yes. Nope. Absolutely. So a book is obviously a huge undertaking. What has it done for you in your business? Oh, so to be perfectly honest, I've had to put a lot of my business on hold with the whole publishing process. So I decided to go traditional publishing um, and not self-publish. And it's like having a boss again. We'll just say that. It's like having a boss. You no longer have the freedom. Um, there are a lot of deadlines and that there's so many pro there's so many pros and cons of self-publishing and 
traditional publishing. Um, but I think with traditional publishing, one of the cons is just that things like they may say by tomorrow, we need X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, your the date is the launch date is this date, but now it has to get pushed. So there's a lot that you can't control. So there's been so much greatness that's come with publishing a book, but also a lot of needing to put things on hold in my business, which I didn't really see ahead of time how much of a sacrifice it would have been. Do you find with clients that you've been able to, one, be able to reach a wider audience because now you do have this book out and they can see what it is that you do and see your words and your purposes and actually get a transformation right from the book. Um, and then also, has it helped almost give you that kind of expertise? I mean, it's a book. Yeah, so I think originally I would have thought that like once you publish the book, it's out there. So many more people are going to see it. Like almost like that overnight success kind of feeling that that's sort of what I was anticipating. And what I've learned now, cause we're like three months in is that this is just a long haul. Like this is something that's going to take a while. And it's very rare that a first time author hits a New York times bestselling list or any type of bestseller list. Um, or like completely sells out all copies. Um, it's, a, it's very, very difficult to sell books. Um, but I know that in the future, and I think this is the, the, one of the hardest parts about business for a lot of people, because everyone want that, wants that quick win or that overnight success. But having it definitely like, puts you ahead, right? Because you have that credibility. You have this physical book and it's almost like a business card that you can hand out to people. Um, and it's like almost like building your email list in some ways, like nurturing um, those leads. So people will buy your book, read it, and then maybe in a couple of years, they'll get to that place where they're like, oh, I'm ready to get this started or I'm ready to work with you. And I think of it as you know, some of the people that I work with one-on-one -on -one now or in my mastermind, they're people that downloaded freebies from me three, four years ago. And it's been a long journey for them to get to this place, to be in this place in their business where they can invest. So I think it's like the same thing with the book. Yes. No, I definitely agree. And a the interesting part for me has been doing an interview and someone starts talking about my childhood or a story from the book that I told. And I was like, Ooh, you're not supposed, how do you know that? And then they like, look at me like it's in the book oh, yes. yeah, that's it. <laughs> because it does, it really gives people an inside look. There are things that I know that I shared in my book that I've never talked about, whether it was from speaking or from the podcast, anything like that. Um, and I do feel almost a deeper connected connection with the people that have read it as far as whether I'm being interviewed. And then also with my clients, the yeah. ones like we did, I listened to your podcast episode where you did your book launch and it was pre COVID. Like it was how many weeks oh, beforehand was it? It, it was like two, oh, two weeks. Oh yeah. And so I had listened to yours and the way that you had done it and was in person and it sounded amazing. And I think, so I did do a book launch party, but we had to do it virtually. Yeah. And it was kind of, I, every time before we started, I would go back to thinking about how you had done yours in person. You were able to thank those people and see those people. Um, but then to be able to have this virtually done where everybody got to be a part of it. So there was that, you know, clients that live across the country in California wouldn't have been able to come necessarily yeah. for that. So to be a part of it in that way, I think it was just such an amazing experience. And I do feel that much closer with a lot of those clients, especially, and it was, it was kind of like, we set it up, um, for the virtual book launch party where my best friend, who's also my avatar came on and that's how we started the party was her and I kind of having a conversation about some of the stories that were in the book about my childhood, um, especially my parents, because she was grew up, was around them for so many years at this point. Um, and I do, it gave them, that wouldn't have been able to happen because she doesn't live 
in North Carolina, which is where I would have done it. She lives up in New York. Um, and it was just, I don't know. It, That's so special. It, it makes it that much more like a behind the scenes, very vulnerable. And I think that's a piece of a book is like you're opening yourself up to a lot by publishing a book. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what I tell people, I actually did a four part series on my podcast. I think today is actually part four. Um, but I walk them through all of the steps of writing the book from the idea to the whole launch. So I think today, Today is a launch episode, actually. Yes. Um, so it walks them through like what I did for the launch, what worked, what didn't work. Um, and what I tell people is, because I think people feel like, oh, I have so much to say. I'm going through so much right now, but I'm not ready to talk about this yet. But a book takes so long to, from start to finish, it's a long process. So just write while it's raw, write while you're experiencing all of those feelings, because once you're out of it, I feel like you sort of forget where you were. So I'm so grateful. Like chapter seven of the book is the lie of, I can't be a good mom and a business owner. And that chapter was written while I was in the thick of it, while I was experiencing it. And back then I never would have felt like, oh, I can't publish this. Like I'm not through it yet. It's still a wound. It's not a scar yet. Um, but today I'm like, oh, I can totally talk about that. I can laugh about it now because it was, you know, almost three, yeah, almost three years ago. I no, I just, so you talk a little bit, we mentioned your podcast. We obviously mentioned the book. We're going to make sure that we link to it in the show notes. It's thinking like a boss. Um, it's on Amazon, Barnes Noble, all the places you can make sure to get a book. And what is your podcast? It's called thinking like a boss. Um, that was the name that I had for the book, for the podcast, like way before it all started. Um, and each week I do just little 20 minute teaching episodes. So I do like four part series. So like the past four weeks was the book thing. The next teaching series is on boundaries. Um, most of my listeners are busy, busy entrepreneurs or busy moms. And as you know, it's like, it's nice having short episodes. Yes. No, it's perfect. And I do like, I've loved listening to your podcast and I found you. Um, where else are you on Instagram? Like what's your favorite social media for people to connect with and you? Instagram is my favorite, just my name, Kate Krako. And I recently started a behind the scenes account, which is Kate Krako author. Okay, perfect. Well, we're going to make sure to link to those in the show notes. Kate, I appreciate you so much for taking the time Thank to speak you. with me, especially during this crazy time. And I just appreciate you. Thank you so much. This was so wonderful. Of course. Okay. As you could clearly see, Kate and I could have continued to talk all day about the mindset and issues that many of us as women entrepreneurs deal with. If you haven't already got clicked over to the show notes, you're going to want to make sure that you grab her book, Thinking Like a Boss. As always, we appreciate when you put up on Instagram stories um, what exactly, where exactly you're listening to it. You can take a picture, a screenshot of your that episode, and you can tag me at Jenny underscore Melrose as well as at Kate. Krako. I'm as many of you know as well, it always helps when there are podcast reviews. And I wanted to take the time to thank uh, someone who recently left a comment. Amy, Amy Katz from Veggie Save the Day says, it's like Jenny is talking directly to me. I look forward to listening to Jenny every Monday. Her content is always timely and relevant. Often I feel like she is reading my mind and telling me exactly what I need to know. This podcast is a must for all influencer entrepreneurs. Amy, thank you so much for taking the time to leave us review. This does make a huge difference in getting guests as well as making sure that we are delivering what it is that you need. It always makes my heart happy to hear from listeners that they feel like I'm reading their mind, telling them the things that they're questioning and wondering about, because that tells me that I'm delivering the content that I need to be delivering. And as many of you know, I decide on what to deliver based on my Instagram stories. I'm constantly asking you guys questions, polls, trying to get you to tell me what it is that you need help on. So if you're not already following me on Instagram, please make sure that you do at Jenny underscore Melrose and answer those polls. And if you guys would leave me a review, I would love to share it. You just go 
down to your podcasting app, put however your rating, and then write a quick review. All right, guys, until next time, I will see you all then. Thank you.